Welcome to the Sprawl. Today we're going to take a look at an RPG based on the Apocalypse world system called The Sprawl. The Sprawl is a mission-based cyberpunk game focusing on intense action, streamlined rules, and player involvement. This video will not replace reading the full rules, especially for the Game Master, but it should serve as a good introduction. To begin with, let's discuss the setting. I'll assume that most listening to this are at least vaguely aware of the various tropes associated with cyberpunk. Advanced technology, crime-ridden streets, uncaring megacorporations, and shadowy operatives handling dangerous jobs in the night. In The Sprawl, the player characters will be playing as these shadowy operatives, but where they are and what they're doing will vary from game to game. A game of The Sprawl could take place on the neon-lit streets of Neo-Tokyo, the gritty alleyways of Seattle, the independent state of Hong Kong, or even perhaps on the moon. Missions taken up by a crew of operatives could include corporate sabotage, data extraction, theft of a prototype weapon, assassinations, and anything else that could be thought up. To complete these missions, operatives will have to use their professional sets of skills, aided by a nigh limitless breadth of advanced gear and equipment. Surveillance equipment, disguise kits, climbing gear, wingsuits, drones, and of course almost any weapon you can think of. In addition, cyberware is a large part of the sprawl, with most operatives modifying their bodies in some way with artificial parts, such as cyber eyes that can see heat signatures and record everything you see, or powerful cyber arms far stronger than normal human muscles, and can include implanted weapons such as guns or blades. You'll be using these things to accomplish missions both for and against various megacorporations, vying for money, respect, and freedom. In addition, rival professionals, vicious gangs, power-hungry executives, and many, many other threats will likely stand in your way. The sprawl is a rough place to be in, but the rewards are plenty. Moving on, let's discuss the basic mechanics of the sprawl. First thing is stats. Each character in the sprawl possesses six stats that sum up their character aptitudes. These stats are Cool, Edge, Meat, Mind, Style, and Synth. Each stat represents a raw ability at a particular style of action. Cool is used to remain calm in stressful situations. Edge focuses on street smarts. Meat is used for physical prowess. Mind is for mental prowess. Style represents charisma and presence, and synth is used for cyberware and other technology. When you create a character, you'll decide which of these stats you are better and worse at, giving you a modifier for each stat. Like other games based on Apocalypse World, the majority of dice rolling is done using 2d6 dice. The Game Master will rarely roll dice during the game, and whenever a roll is needed, a player will roll 2d6 and add the results together. For most roles, a modifier of some type is joined with the roll, usually a negative 1 to a plus 2, although more extreme modifiers can exist. These modifiers are generally taken from a character's stats. If the combined roll with modifiers is 10 or higher, a full success has been achieved, with either no complications, or sometimes even a bonus involved. A result of 7 to 9 is a success with a cost of some type also known as a weak hit. You might achieve what you wanted, but there's an unforeseen complication, or a hard bargain involved, or you don't get entirely what you wanted. A final result of six or less is a miss, leaving you either with an interesting failure, or a success with a major cost attached to it. No dice result should leave a situation static, meaning that something interesting should always come about because the dice were rolled. If nothing seems interesting as a result, perhaps the dice shouldn't have been rolled in the first place. But when are we rolling dice? The answer is in moves. First, we'll talk about the basic moves that are available to all characters. Moves are more or less a type of action that are triggered by an event happening in the game. For example, take the play hardball move, which states, when you get in someone's face threatening violence, and you intend to carry through, roll edge. This means that when a character in the game threatens another with violence, and means it, 
That player rolls 2d6 and adds their edge modifier to the roll. The wording of the move is fairly specific for a reason. If you threaten someone with violence, but you don't intend to follow through, that is instead more of a bluff, and there is a different move for that. Most of the time, it's bad practice to say that you're using a specific move. Instead, just act out what your character says or does, and when a move is triggered, in this case by threatening someone and meaning it, you'll look to the move and to the dice. In this way, a game of the sprawl is meant to be very narratively focused. Rather than focusing on what moves you can do, and how you trigger them, you're instead meant to act out each scene and roleplay, with interruptions for actions and dice only cropping up when necessary. The triggers for each move will often be obvious when they pop up, but sometimes some discussion might be necessary at the table. We'll go down the list of basic moves now, since they form the core of the gameplay. The majority of moves are linked to a certain stat, adding or subtracting the character's modifier with the roll. First is act under pressure. When you race against the clock, act while in danger, or act to avoid danger, roll cool. With a 10 or higher, you do it, no problem. A 7 to 9 means you stumble, hesitate, or flinch. The game master will offer you a worse outcome, hard bargain, or ugly choice. Act under pressure is sort of a catch-all move for when dice are likely necessary, but no other move seems to fit. This move is used for avoiding a hail of gunfire, finding a hiding spot as a group of security cards come down the stairs, or picking a lock while a camera is temporarily disabled. Act under pressure is always used when there's some imminent threat or danger that could cause immediate complications upon failure. If there's no imminent danger, or you've done something to avoid one, there might not be any need to roll dice. Next, apply first aid. When you treat someone's wounds using appropriate medical equipment, roll cool. We'll discuss taking damage and restoring it later, but this is the main move used to treat another individual. Assess. When you closely study a person, place, or situation, or when you quickly size up an opponent or a charged situation, roll edge. With a 10 or more, you gain 3 hold, and with 7 to 9, you get only 1 hold. You can think of hold as a type of currency that is only used for a given move. Gaining assess hold means you can only use that hold for the assess move. You do not have to use the hold immediately, but it has to still be relevant to the narrative. With assess, you can use hold to ask the game master from the provided list of questions. The game master may ask some questions in return to clarify your intent, but they should be truthful and generous with their answers. You get to take plus one forward for acting upon the answers, meaning you get plus one to your next dice roll if it involves the answers to your questions. Assess can be used both during a calm situation, such as observing a building or monitoring a situation, or during times of action, such as a firefight. Both situations potentially allow you to gain some sort of advantage using the knowledge the Game Master provides, whether it's in the next 10 days, or the next 10 seconds. Assess is a very useful move, and should not be forgotten about. Play Hardball As mentioned, when you get in someone's face threatening violence and you intend to carry through, roll Edge. With a 10 or higher, the NPC that you're threatening will do what you want, and if you're using it against a PC, they get to choose to obey or not. With a 7 to 9, for NPCs, the Game Master gets to choose one of the potential options, each involving a complication of some type. Players can again choose to obey or not, but they get plus one forward to act against the opposing player. Play Hardball is a pretty self-explanatory move, as threats are a pretty common occurrence in games such as the Sprawl, but just remember that you only use this move when you fully intend to carry through with your threat. Acquire Agricultural Property, a play on buying the farm, is used when a character is on the brink of death. Again, we'll discuss damage and dying later, but use this move when you run out of health. Rolling 2d6 and adding your meat score, with a 10 or higher you get to survive until the medics arrive, meaning you live to fight another day. With a 7 to 9 you survive with a cost, meaning either a corporation or organization saved you and you owe them. 
you got substandard treatment, so you take minus one to a stat. Or your cyberware took some damage. With a six or lower, you die. Life's tough sometimes. Mix it up. This is the main basic move for characters wishing to handle a situation with violence. When you use violence against an armed force to seize control of an objective, state that objective and roll meat. With a roll of 7 or higher, you achieve that objective. But, on a 7 to 9, you have to choose two complications from the list. Either taking some damage, an ally taking damage, something of value being destroyed, or you make a lot of noise. Rather than dictating each bullet from each gun, the sprawl has you explaining a slightly broader objective. So, rather than saying I use my heavy pistol to shoot the security guard in front of me, you might instead say you dive for cover behind the laboratory counter, activate your synthetic nerves to increase your reaction time, and attempt to shoot the guard in the knees. That is not to say that the first option is wrong, but explaining a broader objective and involving yourself in the fiction in a cinematic way allows for much more flexibility on both the player side and the game master side. Research is used when you investigate a person, place, object, or service using a library, dossier, or database, or a combination of them. When you do, ask a question from the list shown and roll mind. With a 10 or higher, take one intel, the game master will answer your question, and you get to ask a follow-up question from the list. With a 7 to 9, you get an intel, and the game master will answer your question. With a 6 or less, the game master will still answer your question, but he will also get to make a move of his own to complicate things. Research is similar to the assess move, as both are used for providing a character with information. But instead of observing a person, place, or situation, with research you examine data of some type. This can include publicly searching records, hacking into a system for private schedules or reports, or even going into an old-fashioned library. Intel is another type of currency, like hold, but will be explained later. Fast talk is when you try to convince someone to do what you want with promises, lies, or bluster, and roll style. On a 10 or higher, NPCs do what you want, and players can choose to do it or not. If they do, they get to mark one experience. If they don't, they have to roll for act under pressure to resist. With a 7 to 9, NPCs will still do it, but someone will find out that they did. For PCs, you must choose to either give them the potential of gaining XP, or forcing them to roll act under pressure if they decline your request. The choice in the end of obeying you or not is still up to them, however. Fast talk comprises any form of persuasion, bluff, or deception using words. You can of course threaten violence with fast talk, but only if you're just bluffing. If you fully intend to shoot the guard if he moves, then you're rolling play hardball instead. Remember, this move is only used when you're trying to convince someone to do something. Otherwise, you're just talking. Hit the street is used when you go to a contact for help, and you roll style. With a 7 or higher, you get what you want, but with a 10 or higher, you get a little extra. With a 7 through 9, you have to choose a couple of problems, such as your request costing you extra, taking more time, causing unwanted problems, or your contact instead asking you for some help first. Most games of the sprawl are going to involve a number of characters, both helpful and harmful. To better deal with the harmful ones, you can always go to the helpful ones for assistance. Whether this involves a particular set of skills for a job, a unique piece of gear, or a key piece of information, Hit the Street lets you hopefully get some help with an upcoming job. Declare a contact, on the other hand, lets you bring a new individual into the game world. This is a special basic move that doesn't require a roll, and can only be used once per mission. When you declare a contact, name and describe the contact, and then explain why the contact owes you a favor, or why you owe them one. The Game Master will likely ask some additional questions about the contact before adding them to the world. Of course, this move lets you bring in a new contact for a hit the street move, but also lets players declare new things about the game world. Adding a contact in the Mafia brings in the Mafia to the game. 
and adding in a corporate scientist friend that specializes in a new type of Bioware, lets a player introduce elements to a game that they want to see explored. Contacts are immensely useful for groups of characters that specialize in certain skills, and if you need a skilled pilot, hacker, doctor, gunrunner, or sniper, they might only be a phone call away. Produce equipment and reveal knowledge are two similar moves that are used during the middle of a mission. During the legwork phase of a mission, when you're preparing to do the job, characters will use moves such as hit the street and research to gain intel and gear. Intel and gear are specific terms in the sprawl, and they exist as a form of currency to be used during a job. Produce equipment lets you spend an earned point of gear to declare that you have a specific piece of equipment. For example, during a mission in which you didn't plan on needing climbing equipment, but you suddenly find that you need it, you might spend a point of gear with produce equipment to explain how your contact threw it in the bag along with the recording equipment you got from them. This equipment needs to be explained in a reasonable, rational way, so no pulling out prototype laser cannons or gravity bombs, unless that makes sense within the game. Reveal Knowledge works in a similar way, using accumulated intel to declare a sudden advantage during a mission. You'll have to spend a point of intel, explain exactly how you got this knowledge, and what the knowledge is. This move might let you learn about the ventilation system in a building that you can move through, or perhaps security information, if you can rationalize it. This move also lets you declare some fiction within the game world, if the game master finds it reasonable. Both of these moves allow us players to spend less time planning for every contingency before a mission, making the entire process more simple and more fun for everyone involved. Of course, players that enjoy planning for everything can still do so. With help or interfere, when you help or hinder another character, roll links with them. We'll discuss links shortly, but with a 7 or higher you can give the character plus 1 or minus 2 on their next relevant dice roll, your choice. With a 7 to 9, however, you are entangled in the result of their dice roll in some way, and may suffer some consequences. This move will hopefully be used more to help than to interfere, but the option is there. Using it to help can offer a lot of advantages for a team working together, providing cover fire for someone trying to run across a room, using blueprints of a building to help navigate for someone, or even joining in a firefight can all be considered helping. Plus one on a dice roll might not seem like much, but it can often be the difference between success and failure. The other basic moves will be discussed a little later in more detail, but these are the moves that will be used the most by the players during regular play. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's move on to actually starting a game of the Sprawl. First, we'll have to define the corporations that exist in your game of the Sprawl. Each player, including the Game Master, is going to invent a single corporation to be used in the game. The level of detail for each corporation can vary depending on the game, but you should at least define the major sphere of influence that the corporation covers, whether it be consumer goods, news, entertainment media, weapons and arms, vehicles, security contracts, the matrix, so on and so on. Most corporations will branch out into many areas of business, but each should be well known for a couple of things. These corporations will likely form a major part of your game, so some care should be taken to define them. Next, each player will choose a playbook. Playbooks can be thought of a bit like classes in other RPGs, as they describe the special skills that separate characters from one another. There are ten playbooks to choose from, and they are the driver, the fixer, the hacker, the hunter, the infiltrator, the killer, the pusher, the reporter, the soldier, and the tech. I won't go over all of these playbooks, as that's best done at the table, but many of them are likely self-explanatory of what they're good at. The driver excels at handling vehicles, and can even control vehicles using a neural interface. The hacker is the go-to character for using the matrix to access digital systems for the purpose of opening doors, disabling cameras, stealing data, and much more. The killer is the primary playbook for delivering death, whether it be from pistols, shotguns, rifles, or even a katana. The reporter is a bit of a different playbook style that lets you gather evidence on a story live stream from the scene to avoid harm, 
and demand the truth from a target for the sake of journalism. Each playbook comes with some starting special moves, some cyberware, some gear, some additional moves you can earn, and two directives. Directives allow characters to additionally define their character and how their lives and personalities affect how they operate. They also allow additional opportunities to gain experience. For example, the financial directive says that when you hinder the mission for a chance at extra profit, mark experience. This immediately helps define the character to the group and allows for some potential interesting situations during a mission. This also tells the game master that you as a player want to see opportunities for your character to risk things for extra profit. Some of the directives have you fill in a blank, such as protective. When you put your responsibility to blank ahead of the mission, mark experience. This blank could be a person, a thing, a group, etc. There is a supplied list of directives, but you can also create your own if you wish. After you pick a playbook, you'll begin filling it out by naming and describing your character, assigning numbers to the various stats, ranging from negative one to plus two, choosing your cyberware and how you obtained it, choosing your starting moves, choosing your gear, and choosing your directives. Many of these choices will come from lists written on your playbook, while some can be discussed and expanded upon. Many choices will be offered based on the specialties of the playbook, meaning a hacker will make some choices about his cybertech, used for hacking, while a driver will discuss his special vehicle. Finally, you'll define your links with other characters. Links are used for the help or interfere move, and will hopefully continue to increase as you do missions with the same group. Each player will mention a job that they did against a specific corporation in-game, and what their role in the job was. They should have a major part in the proceedings of this job, but excessive details aren't necessary. Then, going around the table, each other player can opt to describe their role in that job, if they so choose. If they mention that they were involved, they get plus one links with your character, and the Game Master will advance the countdown clock for that specific corporation. We'll discuss countdown clock shortly, but in this case it's basically the awareness level of the corporation to your group of characters. After everyone has either spoken about the job or declined, the next player describes another job against a corporation, either the same one or a different one, and the cycle repeats. If multiple players pick the same corporation, you can force the group to become involved with the corporation from the start, for good or ill. Otherwise, you can spread out the attention across multiple corporations. Regardless, the maximum links that players can start with each other character is plus one. Also, this phase can do a lot more for building the type of game that the players want to see by describing the different types of jobs you've run in the past. With that, character creation should be wrapped up, and it's time to begin the game. This is going to depend largely on the Game Master, and there's an entire chapter in the rules that discusses the first session. The core of the gameplay in the sprawl revolves around missions. The mission tends to follow a similar structure each time, but of course variations can exist. Ordinarily, the first step is getting the job. Within the game, jobs can come from many different sources, such as anonymous corporate executives, fixers, gangs, bulletin boards in the Matrix, and so on. Once you actually get down to discussing the job, however, you're going to be using the get the job move. When you negotiate the terms of a job, roll edge. With a 10 or higher, you get to choose three from the list, and with a 7 to 9, you get to choose one. With a 6 or lower, you still get the job, of course, you just don't get any of the benefits. These include gaining an intel, gaining a gear, learning that the job pays well, the meeting doesn't attract attention, or learning the identity of the employer. For every option that you don't select, or if you get a 6 or lower, you can assume that the opposite for each is true. The job won't pay well, the meeting will attract attention, the employer is unknown, and there's no free intel or gear. Misses, of course, allow the game master to make a move of his own, complicating things in interesting ways. After you get the job, each player will stake a number of cred on the success of the mission. Cred is an abstract form of money in the sprawl that is used to pay for gear, cyberware, and other things. 
Most basic common necessities are not paid for in cred, but are just assumed to be owned. Each player crosses that cred off from their sheet, and if they complete the job successfully, they get back twice what they staked, assuming the employer pays them in full. If the job pays well, you get back three times what you staked, and various situations could cause an even higher multiplier. Once you have the job, the legwork phase begins. Here is where you'll begin preparing for the mission, scoping out locations, doing research, and gathering gear that you might need. Here is also where we'll discuss countdown clocks. Countdown clocks serve a variety of purposes in the sprawl, but generally signal a negative event that is going to come to pass. The corporation clocks, as mentioned, showcase the increasing amount of attention that a group is making for each corporation. Each countdown clock is shown as a series of boxes, labeled 1500, 1800, 2100, 2200, 2300, and midnight. As various triggers activate each clock, the leftmost unfilled box will be filled in. So, each corporation clock will begin empty, and as a group attracts attention to themselves in the eyes of that corporation, the boxes will continue to be filled in, starting from the left side at 1500. Certain events can occur as each box is filled in, both descriptively and prescriptively. When the clock strikes midnight, generally something very bad happens, as described by each clock. For the legwork phase, the group will have a single legwork clock. The legwork clock tracks how much noise the group is making during their preparations, and how aware the target is of their intentions. By default, the target has no awareness. But as the legwork clock ticks by, the target will begin to hear rumors, which turn into reliable information, meaning the target gets more and more prepared themselves. This way, a group hopefully strikes a careful balance between the amount of preparation they think is necessary and avoiding going too far in their efforts. Once the legwork phase has been deemed finished, the action phase begins. This is where the mission itself occurs, and the action clock begins. The action clock will often be advanced at the start of the mission based on how advanced the legwork clock was, correlating to the amount of preparation the target took. This may mean that a target begins as if nothing was wrong, or a target may be on full alert. As the mission progresses, the group may continue to make mistakes, or have a very loud and noisy approach, causing the target to escalate their security. They may begin to bring in outside help if they deem it necessary, potentially bringing in overwhelming forces and causing corporation clocks to advance. Along with this, the game master should continue to escalate the severity of moves that they make as the action clock advances, causing additional stress and danger for the group. The sprawl is a dangerous place by itself, even more so when messing with corporations. In addition, for each character that staked three cred on the mission, the action clock or legwork clock was advanced once, starting with action, then legwork, then action, etc. High stakes makes things more interesting. Hopefully, the mission was successful, accomplishing whatever goal the employer set out for you. If so, it's time to meet back up with them so the group can get paid. For this, we use another move, getting paid. When you go to a meet to get paid by your employer, roll and add the number of unfilled legwork segments. This is a bit of an interesting move, because its success is somewhat tied to how well the group handled the legwork phase. The action phase is largely irrelevant as far as the move is concerned, as long as the mission was successful. With a 10 or higher, you get to choose 3, a 7 to 9 gets you 1, and again with a 6 or less it's assumed you chose none. The possible problems from this phase include the meat being an ambush, not getting paid in full, and attracting outside attention. This also allows for another opportunity to recognize the employer, or learning something from the mission so everyone gets an experience point. Many potential complications can arise from this meeting, and a game master should put a lot of thought into interesting scenarios that could crop up. The target may pop up for some immediate revenge, or hire someone else to do so, or may go after the employer instead. The employer themselves may have no wish to pay the group and just attempt to eliminate them. A group should always be wary, and should never walk into a place they don't know how to walk out of. That's good advice in general in the sprawl. That's the basic structure of sessions in the sprawl, from one mission to the next. 
Of course, this is an RPG, and variations can always exist. Maybe a group makes their own missions for a little while, hoping to earn their cred themselves, or a mission might be a bit extended and clocks might have to be adjusted. The basic framework is there for any group to adjust and manipulate to suit the group's interests. Let's move on to discussing other miscellaneous subjects, such as weapons. It would be a rare sprawl campaign that didn't involve violence of some type, and weapons are often the way to accomplish that. Rather than a vast array of different types of pistols, shotguns, rifles, and explosives that some cyberpunk games dive into, the sprawl streamlines things. There aren't 15 types of assault rifles as far as the mechanics are concerned, there is only one. That being said, within the fiction of course, there likely is a number of different assault rifles, and the mechanics are open to variations on those assault rifles. For this video though, we'll just discuss the basics. Every weapon does a number of damage, known as harm. Each character possesses a harm clock, which functions much like every other countdown clock, and shows the overall health of a character. With an empty harm clock, a character is relatively untouched, but as damage ticks by, the character will be in worse and worse shape, eventually leading to an acquire agricultural property move and possibly death. When a character takes harm from an attack or damage source of some type, they subtract their armor from the damage received, and then mark a number of boxes on their harm clock equal to the final result. For example, if a character gets hit by a bullet from a revolver, equaling two harm, but they have an armored vest, equaling one armor, they fill in one box on their harm clock. In addition, even if a character takes zero harm, or stun damage, they must roll the harm move. The harm move is a 2d6 roll plus any harm suffered. Our revolver example would be 2d6 plus 1, whereas if armor reduced an attack to 0, it would just be 2d6. The harm move is unique in the fact that you want to roll lower on this one instead of high. A 6 or lower result means nothing special happens, you just take the attack. 7 to 9 means the game master will choose one of the options listed such as you losing your footing or grip or get distracted in some way. A 10 or higher is the worst, leaving you to choose from one of the options listed, such as being knocked unconscious, forfeiting your armor from the attack, losing the use of cyberware, or even losing a body part. The combat in the sprawl is quick and dangerous, with very few characters surviving a hail of bullets for very long at all. So there exists a number of weapons, mostly anything you would expect and each has a harm value, from a small pistol to a missile launcher. In addition, each weapon has a number of tags. Tags are descriptors for a piece of gear that describes how it operates. These help you understand how it works in the fiction, but can also change how it works mechanically. Many of these are obvious for any given weapon. All weapons have a range tag that tells you how far from a target that it effectively operates, from hand meaning close enough to touch, to close, within a few steps, near, within a couple of dozen meters, to far and extreme. Again, this is often obvious, as a knife is best used in melee, and a sniper rifle is used at far or extreme ranges. Other tags tell you if a weapon pierces through armor, has auto-fire capability to hit an area of targets, is dangerous, meaning a user might harm themselves with the weapon, or it's loud. Tags can also apply to gear as well, or vehicles, and new tags can be created if it makes sense. Recording equipment might have the audio tag, or the video tag, or both, or might have the encrypted tag for extra security. To buy all this gear, generally you'll be spending cred. Sometimes gear might be supplied or given to you, but most of the time you'll be hitting the street to get it yourself. Each character in the sprawl starts out with five cred and hopefully you'll be earning a lot more. One cred will get you basic restricted gear at a fair price, such as pistols and hunting rifles with ammo, or hiring some basic muscle for a job. Two cred might get you better help for a job, such as a getaway driver or hacker, and more complex gear, like assault weapons and drones. Four cred will get you a really good hacker, discreet medical services, or expensive gear like vehicles and heavy weapons. 8 cred will get you cutting-edge equipment like cyberdecks and military vehicles. 
Of course, like many things, these prices and availability are subject to change. Cyberware is a bit of a special case, as it tends to be quite expensive. You might have to both pay for the cyberware itself, as well as paying for someone to install it on you. If you get some cyberware as part of a mission, then great. Otherwise, you'll probably have to hit the street and spend around 8 cred. After you get the cyberware, you'll have to find a surgeon to install it. Whether this is a backroom, unlicensed doctor, or a corporate specialist. Each has their pros and cons. If you have it installed by a corporation, great, you're done, with no complications. Other than the fact that the corporation now owns your cyberware, and they get to decide how it works or when it works. If you go to a street doctor, you have to use the under the knife move. When you do, spend an amount of cred, either 0, 1, or 2, and then add the number to a 2d6 roll. With a 10 or higher, you've got no complications. 7 to 9, something went a little wrong, such as the cyberware eventually going to fail on its own, or it's of substandard quality, or sometimes randomly it doesn't work at all. With a 6 or less, the Game Master definitely gets to make things interesting, and you'll probably wish you hadn't gotten cyberware in the first place. If cyberware gets damaged later on, you might get someone knowledgeable to repair it without surgery. Otherwise, you'll have to go under the knife again. Cyberware consists of things such as cyber eyes, allowing for thermographic vision, light amplification, flare compensation, recording, and magnification. Cyber ears function in a similar way, letting you record everything you hear, dampen extremely loud sounds, or letting you hear further away. Cyber comms is an internal headwear communication suite that lets you communicate without using your voice, which can be highly advantageous. These bits of cyberware let you use your synth stat to replace the ordinary stat for assess roles for seeing, hearing, and communications, respectively. Cyber arms can let you do additional harm with melee weapons, and have implanted weapons such as retractable blades to surprise enemies. Cyber legs give you a plus one for acting under pressure, when it would involve the increased athleticism of your legs. Dermal plating are hardened plates under your skin that make the harm move less painful. The list goes on. If you just want a basic prosthetic that functions identically to a normal limb, those are generally free and don't require a move. Cyberware is technology that enhances the human form in some way. Next, we'll discuss hacking. Hacking is greatly simplified in the sprawl compared to similar RPGs, and will likely not cause much confusion. Hacking involves the Matrix, which is akin to what we know as the internet, but in cyberpunk is generally much more ubiquitous. The sprawl gives a group freedom to decide if the Matrix is more wired, like older cyberpunk RPGs, or wireless, such as newer settings. Again, each has its pros and cons, and will depend on the group's interest in the type of game they want to play. A wireless matrix allows for a lot of interesting equipment that connects to the matrix, while also allowing for a lot of security concerns for everyone involved. A wired matrix gives you a grittier feel to the sprawl, with hackers often running wires from their brains into a computer. Regardless, the hacking portion functions much the same way. To hack, you'll need a cyberdeck, a highly illegal and expensive piece of tech. You can use a cyberdeck on its own, but it's going to be slow, and all your hacking moves will be done with a negative one modifier, instead of the stat you'd normally roll. Ideally, you'll be using a neural interface to directly link your brain in the computer, so you can work at the speed of thought. There are a number of special matrix moves that a hacker will employ to accomplish what they want. I won't go over them in detail, as the hacker and the game master should definitely read the section on the matrix. You'll use login to gain access to a system, and then likely manipulate systems to affect the various physical systems in a building, and compromise security to avoid attention and danger. Ice will likely crop up, meaning intrusion countermeasure electronics, and attempt to interrupt you in some way. Depending on the severity of the ice program, they will try to sever your connection, trace your physical location, trigger an alarm, damage your cyber deck, or perhaps even damage your brain directly. Ice is almost always a problem that needs to be dealt with in some way, often using the melt ice move to destroy, disable, or evade them. 
This way, the Game Master can use ice to trouble the hacker, and use physical threats to trouble the rest of the group. A hacker might even get locked into the Matrix with no way of jacking out, leaving the rest of the group to support his physical body. The Matrix is a very interesting part of the sprawl, and will often be involved in many jobs. Not every group needs a player to play as a hacker, but be prepared to hire a good one for a number of jobs. Finally, leveling up. Throughout sessions of the sprawl, you'll earn a number of experience points, from the course of a mission to your directives and occasionally different moves. When you have 10 experience points, you get to choose a basic advancement from a list, such as gaining a new move or increasing one of your stats by plus one to a maximum of plus two. After you've taken five basic advancements, you can begin to take major advances, such as increasing a stat to plus three, rewinding a corporate clock, changing your playbook, or making a second character. These advances have to make sense within the fiction, like anything else in the sprawl, but allows a character to continue to evolve throughout play. This is only a basic summary of the sprawl, and of course I highly recommend reading the full rules, especially the Game Master. There are a number of subsystems related to running a game of the sprawl that I didn't delve into, but this should serve as a good foundation for understanding how the game plays. Whether or not the sprawl is the game for you and your table is not a matter for me to decide, but the sprawl is a relatively simple entry into the cyberpunk genre that doesn't get bogged down with rules for every circumstance or situation. The focus of the game is on the narrative and the action, allowing for intense situations and cinematic scenes in a variety of cyberpunk environments. I hope this video has been of some help to some people, and I'll see you fine folks around.